During the Cold War, the non-aligned movement sought a new way of politics. Filmmaker Mila Turelich explores that legacy in two new films. I'm Tom Powers, and this is Pure Nonfiction. Mila Turelich has spent nearly 20 years exploring the history of Yugoslavia. She was born in Belgrade and still in grade school when her country was divided into separate republics in the early 1990s. Growing up Yugoslav and then waking up one morning to be told you're no longer Yugoslav, you're now Serb, there's so much there to grapple with, and that's maybe then a lifetime's work of, you know, what pro political project was my childhood rearing part of? How can that disappear from one day to the next? And then what do you base your world wor worldview on? For her first film, Cinema Communisto, she gained access to the Yugoslav film archives when they were in a limbo after the country's breakup. Yugoslavia's longtime leader, Tito, loved movies and made deep investments into producing newsreels and fiction. Cinema Communisto makes dazzling use of this footage. Mila also interviewed Tito's personal projectionist to better understand the country's relationship with cinema. Mila's deep experience working in archives led her to her most recent projects. She formed a friendship with Tito's favorite cameraman, Stefan Labudovic. She uncovered a vast treasure of 35mm films that he shot in the 1950s and 60s when he was bearing witness to a vibrant era of decolonization in Africa and Asia. His camera captured many key leaders of the time, Sukarno from Indonesia, Nasser from Egypt, Nehru from India, and many more. Tito partnered with these figures to create the non-aligned movement as a political alternative to the spheres of influence held by the United States and the Soviet Union. In 1961, Tito gathered 25 countries for the first summit of the non-aligned movement in Belgrade. This chapter has largely been forgotten as historians focus on other areas of the Cold War, but Mila was driven to better understand it through the footage of Lubudovic. Tito knew that most of the countries coming into their independence had no resources for filmmaking, so he sent Lubudovic on a journey to document what was happening. The cameraman probably considered himself a propagandist in a media battle with the world's superpowers. One of the countries he visited was Algeria during the height of its anti-colonial war against France. Lubudovic would spend three years documenting the struggle, including frontline battles. His footage was turned into short newsreels, but most of what he shot was never seen. It remained in the Yugoslav archives, much of it not even cataloged, until Mila and her colleagues started digging through it. The material was so vast that she wound up making two films to explain it. One is non-aligned that focuses on the Belgrade summit. The other is Cine Guerrillas that looks at the war in Algeria. Both films are subtitled Scenes from the Lubudovic Reels. Last month, Mila was in New York to present both works at Anthology Film Archives, and we sat down to talk. We begin with the mixed legacy of Yugoslavia's leader, Tito. I asked, what did Tito mean to her? So Tito died a year after I was born, but definitely for the first seven or eight years of my life, we were still singing songs to him on his birthday, and his photo was in our classroom walls, and he kind of really was permeated the social life of Yugoslavia. And so, yes, it took me a long time to figure out that he was actually dead. But um, I grew up in a family that politically was anti-Tito, even though it was a, it was social democratic, which made them anti-communist. But uh, um, And so in my house, you know, there was one narrative of Tito, and then obviously in my school there was another narrative of Tito, and then by the time I hit my teenage years and the disappearance of Yugoslavia, he was just gone. So, you know, my neighbor, who was four years younger than me, he couldn't recognize the image of Tito. So this also speaks to the kind of violence of erasure. And uh, again, made me want to grapple a little bit about who was this man, particularly as I'd grown up with one story and you know had been fed another. And ultimately, what I really loved doing in Cinema Comunista was seeking a position that was neither for nor against, that was kind of expansive. Um, and I find that has become necessary in almost all of the work that I've been doing, that it's really seeking to 
allow from multiplicity of viewpoints and understandings and readings and kind of really seeks to move the storytelling away from extremes. Um, and that is where Tito is now situated, if you like, in my, <laughs> in my view of Yugoslavia. Well, Tito, for, your, for the purposes of your work, is a significant figure because he really saw a power in film, uh, b- both in uh, fiction film that he uh, promoted as leader of Yugoslavia, uh, but also in, we can call them newsreels, we can call it propaganda. He was the force behind uh, sending out cameramen around the world and specifically the cameraman that uh, you focus on. No, you're absolutely right. So I think why I keep finding myself engaging with Tito is because he was the consummate storyteller and he spun the story that gave shape to our lives, essentially. And so in Cinema Comunisto, and all of this is completely random. I, you know, three years into the making of the film, I found out that he had had a projectionist who had shown him films for his entire reign, so more than 30 years, and that he was still alive and that he'd never given an interview. And by the time I managed to build a relationship with him, I came to understand that he had shown Tito a film every single night. So, you know, and he held very detailed diaries of every film. And I can even tell you which film Tito watched the day I was born, which is Milos Forman's Hair. (laughs) It's kind of extraordinary, (laughs) but true. Um, And so then, you know, cut to 10 years later, no, seven years later, I meet... Stevan Labudovic, who happened to have been Tito's cameraman. And it kind of became a running joke in my circle of friends that, you know, if you're over 85 and you knew Tito, call Mila and she'll make a <laughs> film about you. So I really had a moment of hesitation, thinking, I don't want to go back into this world. I've done I've done that story. I've told that story. But where Stevan Labudovic was really exceptional and this story becomes a completely bigger story is that as Tito's cameraman, Tito had sent him in a gesture of solidarity that's absolutely astounding to f- document and film liberation movements in Africa during the decades of the decolonization of the continent. And that just took the story to you know a level that for me was just incredible that no one had ever told it before. So let me take a step back. If I understand the story correctly, you were in Algeria visiting um, a museum about uh, Algeria's um, fight for independence. And you came across uh, an exhibit um, that celebrated this Yugoslavian uh, cameraman. I, am I right that that's how you first heard of, of Stefan yes, Badova? Yes, absolutely. So what happened is with Cinema Comunisto, my first film, I got invited to a film festival in Algeria. And because Algeria is not open to tourism and travel, I obviously jumped on the opportunity to go see this country. And... The film screening was one of the most intense emotional experiences that I've had. Like, people were in tears, and I couldn't quite decipher why an Algerian audience would be so emotionally responsive to a story of Yugoslavia. Went to visit the National Museum, which is the military museum, <clears throat> and indeed there is a room devoted to a man called Stevan Labudovic, who was this cameraman who had filmed the Algerian Liberation War and whom they call the cinematic eye of their revolution. And it's worth maybe just for context saying the Algerian Liberation War was probably one of the longest and most bloody anti-colonial wars fought on the African continent and really is the impetus for the United Nations um, adopting a declaration on decolonization of the world. It's kind of really the turning point in, in that entire story. So it was a very important contribution to see him. So you're in this museum, you're encountering this name for the first time, even though you've immersed yourself in the archives where he's a pretty celebrated figure. Yes, but I had never put, like, the whole story... You know, I knew Yugoslavia had supported Algeria in the war, but that was, like, a vague knowledge. I also knew that the Yugoslav cameramen of the newsreels had had interactions with... But I never put the whole... It, it just hadn't been an area that I was interested in or really knew anything about and wasn't really aware... You were focusing on the archives about Yugoslavia, so... Exactly. Whatever the archives contained about other countries weren't... It, Exactly. And so when the film won the Grand Prix of the festival, they invited me back next year as a guest. And it happens that that year, Stefan Labudovic was the guest of honor of the festival. And because by now I knew the name and I had an idea that he was very important in Algeria, and I was very intrigued to understand that story, I took my camera with me to Algiers. And when I arrived in the hotel, I waited for a kind of had an ambush at the reception desk until he arrived. And then I came up to him and I said, we're both from Belgrade. My name is Mila. 
can I film your stay here? And he was, he was, I think he was bemused. He said, yeah, he was 87. He was kind of, and he said, sure. And so I basically started filming him the day after, um, just documenting his trip to Algiers, the way people reacted to him, stopped him in the street, asking him or or thanking him. Or this is, this is the trip that we see documented in Cine Gorillas. Absolutely. So you see, it's very funny that scene of him in Algiers is the last scene of the diptych, whereas it's the first thing I filmed. But in in a way, the story brings you to that moment. Whereas for me, that moment was the beginning of the of a seven year journey. And so I filmed with him in Algiers and just was stunned by how unknown this story was, how, you know, and, and how profound his contribution had been. So he had been sent to make a documentary film about the Algerian Liberation Army uh, with the idea that it would be shown at the United Nations in this diplomatic push to have the UN kind of take a stand on decolonizing the world. And his mission had been to spend three months. And after three months, he couldn't leave because he said, I can't, what, I'm just going to abandon them to their fight. And so he ended up spending a total of three years going back and forth between being Tito's cameraman in Yugoslavia and being in Algeria embedded with the Liberation Army. And he ended up filming something like, the count is 83 kilometers of film, but what's stunning is it's 35 millimeter film. To take a 35 millimeter Autoflex camera into the maquis, as they say, you know, into the kind of, is extraordinary. It's really extraordinary. And so the archive of all of this is kept in Belgrade. And it's never been digitized and it's never been indexed. And it was just kind of sitting there. And so when I came back with him to Belgrade, the next move was, well, let's go into the archive and try and see some of this footage and have him decipher it for me. Just to stay on the point for a second about 35 millimeter a lot of the footage that we see from that era, especially uh, of combat, was shot on 16 millimeter, sometimes small wind-up cameras, uh, much easier to bring into the field of action. His 35 millimeter camera was a different uh, beast altogether. I mean, this is the night. This is the late 1950s. You know, w when we think about documentary history, we think about this uh, movement that was taking place in the early 1960s of uh, filmmakers seizing 16 millimeter cameras so they could go out in the world. Um, so uh, it's 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 worth <laughs> uh, taking note of that. And it's also astonishing if you get to see the films to see them on a big screen because we did a 4K scan of this footage and it is just you know and he wasn't by accident. Uh, chosen to be Tito's cameraman, he was chosen because he was one of the best cameramen in Yugoslavia. His framing, the composition, I mean, this is a man who really cared about his image, even in kind of extreme war situations. And so the footage is just a, you know, a, a treasure. It's really a treasure. He's 87 years old when you meet. You're in your 30s. We can see in the films that a real, you know, bond uh, forms. He's opening up his... Uh, diaries to you, um, his uh, photographs, you know, probably not a lot of people have shown as much interest in uh, his life as you have. He's near the uh, end of his life. Um, he's lost substantial hearing. When, when we watch you speak to him, you're getting in close to his ear to ask him uh, questions. He's playfully uh, uh, giving you reprimands about how you handle the camera, telling you to clean your lens and that you don't have a sunscreen on your lens, and um, I, you know it's a it's a very moving uh, bond that that forms. Um, how did you feel about that connection to him and the consciousness that you know he's in the twilight of his life? You know, on some very basic level, you know, Stefan was born in 1928, and it's funny, I've almost, in almost every of my films, I've had someone born in 1928, which is the year of my father's birth. So, you know, there's there's an affinity, I think, that I have to... Your to, father, who died when you were young. Yes, and he was also named Stefan. So... <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> there's work to be done there. Um, no, but uh, so just to say, I, I've always had a kind of ease of rapport with people of that generation, and I feel a kind of really close and intimate understanding of the world. It's always been very, very easy for me to kind of enter into their memory. 
Um, and in Stefan's case, you know, what was really wonderful about that w- collaboration, and it really was a collaboration, is that you very rarely get to make a, an archive-based film with the person who filmed the archive. And so being able to try and take you into his frame of mind, into his way of looking at things, and particularly with his diary entries, almost create a kind of interior monologue of the person who's filming at the moment they're filming. And it's maybe important to say that the beauty of this is that we were working with his rushes. And you see so much of the cameraman when you look at the unedited footage. You see the mistakes, you see his feet, you see the repetition of shots. You really see him searching for the way to build the visual language of the storytelling. So to be able to unpack all of that with him was really precious. I hadn't initially anticipated that I would be the person filming in Algeria. It was a necessity because I was there with my camera. But I had always assumed back in Belgrade, you know, a real camera person is going to take over. But he began criticizing me so um it was so fun to me to have, you know, you're you're there with your digital camera and he's, you know, the person who filmed on 35 and he he could, at the end of a shooting day, he could write an entirely precise shot list of everything he had filmed because he had these notebooks. And I don't think that's that's even possible for us as a, in the digital generation. I don't think we have that awareness of every time we've pressed record and what was the shot. And so, you know, I... Um, I, I really took it kindly to his criticism, but I thought it was also such a good narrative instrument to reveal his personality how much he cares for the image you know and and, and how much he treats me as you know a colleague who needs to be kind of mentored and so I just went on filming which really hadn't been the the idea initially and yes I was absolutely aware of the fact that I was in a race against time I got three years with him which was a lot but you know not enough and what I really loved, and his wife said this to me after he passed away, he wasn't that invested in the fact that I was making a film about him. I don't think, he didn't care that much about the outcome. He cared about two things deeply. Um, one is that he got a kick out of the fact that he was back on a shoot, you know, that we, we, that we were filming again. And this is what his wife said to me. She said, but the last three years of his life, you took him back to his passion, you know. We traveled, we filmed. He, you know, I'd all come and he'd be, oh, what, what are we doing next? Where are we going next? So that was one thing. And the other thing that I find really is among my biggest regrets, obviously, beside the fact that he didn't live to see the films, is that he was obsessed, and you're right to say I was in my late 30s, he was obsessed by the fact that uh, he wanted me to have a family. And he said to me, you have the same, you, you, you've been struck with the same illness that I have, which is this passion for the camera and for filming. And he said to me, it's the type of disease that can take over your entire life, and you'll wake up one day and you'll be too old to build anything else. And his biggest obsession was for me to build a family. And so I think that my other regret, beyond the fact that he didn't live to see the film, is that he didn't live to see me have a daughter. But there was just something, he was transmitting life lessons as much as filming lessons, and that made it a very, very deep relationship. Another figure who's prominent in these two films is Jovana Kosic, who works at the Yugoslav Archive. We watch in the films as Mila and Jovana work side by side to face the daunting task of unpacking the Lebudovich reels. So uh, there's two people from the newsreels who are really important to the story. There's the person who was named the director of the archive, and it turned out, fortunately, worked out that that year in Algeria when we were all invited to the festival, he was also invited. So he got to be there to see this bond between Stevan and me develop, to see what I filmed, and most importantly, to see how Stevan was recognized in Algeria. And I think it was really all of those factors that when we came back to Belgrade and I called the archive and I said, I'd like to come in with Stevan, he was all for supporting the project. And we even signed a kind of agreement and collaboration that it really, you know, was essential for the making of these films. So his name is Vladimir Tomčić, and he's been running this archive ever since. So I, I would say almost 20 years now, and he was really instrumental. The other person, as you say, is Jovano, who is the head of the actual archive. And what makes this, um, I think, such an interesting collaboration is Jovano is the same age as me. And so in some ways, she becomes my kind of um, equivalent in, in the film, if you want. You know, She's kind of the stand-in for... Because I, you don't see me in the film, but you see her and, and you see her researching and scanning and looking for things. So there's a kind of wonderful um, bond that develops between us. What what I really cared to show in the film was this process of discovery that happened to me. You know, that the fact that I was unaware of most of the things that you discover in the film, I wasn't aware of them when I started them. And which is why the film took on this form 
of a film that is the making of of the film. Um, and maybe the biggest discovery that I tried also to kind of stage for the the viewer is this uh, moment <clears throat> when we go down into the archive and you realize the quantity of this footage that could be called the non-aligned collection of the archive. Um, and as Jovan and I kind of discuss, and this is how the information enters the film, in the 1960s, due to the work that Labudovic did in Algeria, but also due to other factors, Yugoslavia became the kind of go-to country that newly independent nations in Africa and other liberation movements reached out to, asking for this kind of technical support in the form of a cameraman and footage. And so it goes from the Algerian War to the Mozambican Liberation War, and the first films made for the for Limo, for their liberation movement, were also shot by Yugoslav cameramen. And then in 1970, Labudovic was sent to make a documentary on Yasser Arafat and the PLO. So this collaboration with liberation movements goes on for 20 years. And all of this footage is in Belgrade, and none of it has been digitized. And as you see in here in the film, it's not even indexed. They don't even know what's on there. In addition to which, there is a collection of newsreels that they made for a newly independent Mali, more than 100 newsreels, a collection of newsreels they made for a newly independent Tanzania, which also goes on for a decade. And I just couldn't process the fact that there is an entire wealth of footage of the political birth of another continent that's held in Belgrade that no one seems to know about or even care about, is really working through. And uh, I think that I, I became really overwhelmed by the magnitude of the task and definitely unsure of my ability to rise to that responsibility. And the project from that point on, and maybe this is interesting to speak about, I, my, I think my filmmaking process changed radically since then, which is, I guess the usual way we filmmakers work is, you know, you have an idea, you work on it for five, seven years, and, and then, you know, the moment of birth is, ta-da, there's a world premiere, here's the film. And it's a finished film, and then that film has its life. And I realized that wouldn't work for me anymore because the... Um, the kind of stakes of this go beyond me and my filmmaking project. And so I, it became an outward facing process. And I, so I began doing public presentations of the archives and the story of Labudovic and the documents I was finding to kind of fill in the gaps of the material. And it became, you know, first a series of toxic, like historic conferences or academic conferences. Then it became a kind of artist talk because I was invited into an artist space to talk about the archives. Then it became it became a collaborative project in which many, many people, and, and so I've never found myself in a situation before where this is circulating and I'm talking about it before the film exists. But I've realized that in in some ways it's much closer to an artistic process than a filmmaking process, if that makes sense. But it's made me really appreciative of this kind of porous space between the filmmaking world and the art, the world of art practice, which doesn't work towards this final concrete result that is then revealed to the world, but is a kind of thinking through in which you invite people in much earlier stages of the work to engage, help you figure it out. And what was really important to figure out in this material is, you know, this material is not um, innocent in the sense that this is a political state archive. This is, you know, ideologically infused material created by direct political supervision. And in that sense, Stefan Labudovic, and he never minced words about this, is a propagandist. And he sees himself as a soldier in a propaganda war, a propaganda war happening inside the Cold War. So, you know, there's an ideological confrontation. But for him, the propaganda war is also there is an anti-colonial struggle going on that needs to have its side against a kind of colonial dominant media narrative. So it's the periphery versus the center as well as north versus south. And, and um, you know, that just went beyond what I as a, you know, political scientist slash filmmaker felt... Um, just qualified to address on my own. You would touch the tip of an iceberg. Totally. <laughs> and risk being submerged by it. And so it was also trying to evolve my classic and, you know, usual way of, you know, you kind of, you, 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 you're in, you're kind of editing hole in the dark with another person and this thing is being, and it can, it can be, this had to be like exploded wide open. And as many people as possible had to be invited in to help me engage with that material for me to try and do it justice. 
let me uh, bring up the Belgrade Summit of 1961, which uh, is the framework of the film Non-Aligned. What, what is it? This, yeah. What is, <laughs> what is what, it? What was the Belgrade Summit? <laughs> so if people know anything about the history of the kind of rise of the third world in the kind of anti-colonial era, they will know of Bandung, which was a kind of landmark conference that took place in Indonesia, gathering the leaders of newly independent African and Asian countries. And it really was a seminal moment. Um, five years after that conference, another one took place in Belgrade, and it became known as the first summit of the non-aligned movement. So if Bandung was the kind of first gathering together, the kind of first political shaping of that gathering took place in my hometown. And Belgrade has kind of worn the legacy of being the birth city of the non-aligned movement with great pride when I was a child. And then all of the markers that m that kind of celebrated that moment have over the years just disappeared. Very few people now could, there's an obelisk in the city center that's kind of marks the, I even filmed a scene that's not in the film of just stopping people on the street and saying, do you know what this monument is to? Nobody knew. So <clears throat> again, Going back to my interest in landscapes and, you know, the ruins and how memory disappears from public spaces, I was also trying in this film to visit the sites in Belgrade that hold the memory of this summit. So the summit took place in 1961. It gathered 25 countries and uh, a dozen liberation movements because the African continent was still very much involved in, in its liberation struggles. And uh, So that is a countries that weren't yet officially recognized by the United Nations, but... Uh, or hadn't even achieved their independence. You know, so in 1961, Algeria was still very much inside the colonial war. It was still a French colony, um, as were many other liberation movements that came to Belgrade who were hoping to achieve independence one, one day, but were not... You know, it wasn't on the horizon for them at that but point. But Tito and the other leaders of the non-aligned movement were recognizing them as, uh, as Absolutely. Equals, yeah. So so the one of the biggest gestures of the non-aligned platform was support for the anti-colonial struggle. And uh, they even did this unprecedented thing, which is they gave a seat at the table to the Algerian representatives, even though Algeria was still a colony. So that was like a very big gesture of, uh, you know, taking a position. And um, the non-aligned summits then took place in an irregular fashion. There was Cairo, then there was um, Lusaka, Algiers, and back in Belgrade in 1989. Why I mentioned that it, this is that I remember the Belgrade Summit of 89. I was 10 years old. And it really kind of marked, it was a very vivid event in my kind of childhood political imaginary. And this is the reason why I was always interested in trying to tell a story about the non-aligned movement, because it was a movement that at the time gathered something like a third of the world's population, and yet most people I meet today have never heard of the non-aligned movement. And I just felt that it's very, it's very telling that something so big is so forgotten today, really raises questions about who's writing the histories that we're being taught. You know, where is the center? Where is the periphery? Who holds the power? The information um, battles, you know, that kind of marked the 70s and the 80s and who lost those battles. So I felt that bringing the online movement back into, you know, I was hoping that with a film I could maybe bring it back into a kind of space of dialogue would be also a way of bringing back this exploration of third ways, you know, imaginaries that are gone today. I think we live again in a bipolar world. You're with us or you're with them. Um, you know, and I remember like everything that happened since October, there was even a statement that there's not even two sides to this story. There's one side to the story, you know, and I was trying to make a film about a third side to a story. So just to say that there have always been spaces of trying to imagine different ways of people coming together, different ways of solidarities across you know, various religions, um, ideologies even. And the non-aligned movement really spoke to all of that, which was why I wanted to make it. So 1961, these leaders gathered in Belgrade. They held the summit. And it was a very mediatically interesting event. You know, there was more than a thousand journalists from all over the world. And I was very interested in the kind of media side to the story, how they seized on the media to get a political message kind of into the international public arena. And so... As we were digging through this, we came across 26 reels of unused outtakes from the summit, and they really form the core of the, f the non-aligned film because it's the digitization of this material and trying to understand what's in the reels that becomes kind of the through line of the film, and it kind of leads to this, if you like, climax uh, where I also then go into the archives of the radio, 
and dig out the sound reels of the summit for the first time in 60 years. And Because when you're looking at the film reels, these are all silent film reels. So we'll see, for instance, India's leader Nehru um, at the platform giving a speech, but we can't hear uh, his speech from the footage that was taken. Um, but then you go to Radio Belgrade, the audio archives, and they have sometimes... Um, archives that match up. So you can take a footage of Egypt's leader Nasser giving a speech and find the uh, audio, and suddenly we can hear what uh, Nasser was saying. Sometimes. And then, uh, you know, as you express in the film, like frustratingly, sometimes the audio will run out, or sometimes you have audio but not picture, or picture not audio. And it was a really fascinating process, you know, because I'd spent at that point, I'd spent like five years digging through the visual archive of the summit without sound. And then when I sat to listen to the audio recordings, it was a different event. And it really made me start thinking about Marshall McLuhan's theory of hot and cold media. It was literally like watching the silent footage of the summit and listening to the sound archive of the summit. It was like you were you know, being witness to two different events. This is when I started wondering what would happen when the two come together. And for me, it was really explosive. Because, you know, if the gesture of creating an online movement was this idea, we're going to create a platform, and then we're going to have a summit, and that's going to be our stage. And from here, we're going to project our political voice, a voice that says the world can be other than East versus ve you know West, and us versus them. And then that voice disappears and is really shut out by history and kind of written out the history books to then 60 years later be able to re-give them their political voice was such a meaningful moment for me in the making of the film. So you touched upon this earlier, but uh, it, it, you say in the film that of all the countries that were gathered in 1961 at the Belgrade summit, 25 of those countries didn't have their own film department. So th these newly emerging countries, Mali, Tanzania, Mozambique, the, uh, history is being made uh, in their land, but it's not being recorded because there's no uh, film department. So Tito sends his cameraman to record this history. There's a profound uh, moment in the film where you really illustrate how history gets told. You you pull um, newsreels from French archives and you re pull a report from the U.S. broadcaster NBC reporting on the Belgrade summit, and we uh, really get to see points of view from that. I mean, can you talk about your experience of getting your hands on those and really seeing the comparisons? So I think the gravity of this situation is best illustrated if I tell you that during colonial times, in particular in the French colonies, there was something called the Laval Decree, which actually forbade indigenous populations from filming themselves. So if you, as an indigenous person in an Algerian colony, wanted to film anything, you first had to apply for authorization, and it was usually denied. And uh, the violence of this, in terms of talking about, you know, kind of who archives and what visual memory exists, is uh, is profound. So, with the withdrawal of the colonial powers, these countries were left without the technological means, but also without personnel. There was no one trained who knew how to film, and there was no equipment with which to film, and they really were left without the means with which to document and tell their own birth story. And uh, as you rightly say, I found a document digging through the archives of the former Federal Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the diplomatic archives, because I was looking for the kind of paper trail of this story, the telegrams, the reports, the you know memorandums. One of the documents I found was a report that said, of the 25 countries who were at the summit, 18 have no newsreel production of their own. And they're, you know, they had very stark option. Either they ask their former colonial masters for aid, or they turn to the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union aid was heavily politically conditioned. You know, there would be like a, in, an image of Moscow, or you know, there were there there had to be something. The Yugoslavs opted for a third way, kind of in the philosophy of the non-aligned movement, which is that they were going to provide this aid, uh, but free of political conditions. 
And so to the point where their cameraman would but not be signed as the filmmakers of the newsreels. And so cameraman was sent to Mali, cameramen were sent to Tanzania, and they would train local cameramen at the same time as filming the material to make these to make these newsreels. So what is truly interesting then is when you look at how the colonial powers fought back. And as you say, in Non-Aligned, there is this whole sequence that I built up thinking about the fact that the images of the summit were circulated internationally. And the practice at the time was you would receive the images as they were silent and you would record your own voiceover. So each country's newsreel would record their own voiceover. And I started wondering, well, what were the newsreel reports of the summit that were broadcast to audiences in France. And to, and it's important to say, that, so we're in the early, early 1960s, so this is like the dawn of the television era, and cinema attendance is at its peak, and so newsreels, which are shown in cinemas, are really the dominant visual information medium of the era. And this is really, really important, because I don't think, particularly a young generation, they don't quite understand what newsreels were. But it was the place you went to see the bodies of your leaders in action. There was no other place you could see them at the time. And so the power, it's really important not to underestimate the power newsreels had at the time. And so I went into the French archives, even looked in the US, and was stunned by the narrative that they put over the, the images. And maybe the most striking thing I found was an NBC reporter who um, is reporting from Belgrade from the summit, and then he starts with a shot of the Belgrade Zoo, and then he compares the leaders at the summit to the lesser animals in the zoo. People of Belgrade taking the children to the zoo today may be excused the cynical thought that the collection of statesmen gathered under the common banner of uncommitted is as unnatural a collection as the lesser animals gathered here. It is probably no mere coincidence that the slogan against the policy of war, greatest enemy of mankind, is posted right outside the American embassy. Yugoslavia's Marshal Tito has been known to accuse the United States of warlike policies, even while accepting $2 billion in American aid since 1948. But it speaks volumes to the media struggle, and it really, I think, helps you understand why Labudovic saw himself as a soldier in an information war and why he so kind of proudly hangs on to the title of propagandist, you know. Yes, that's a word that in modern times most of us would uh, run from uh, or, you know, consider the worst insult. Um, so it is worth bringing out here why he wears that word proudly. Because for him, you know, the stakes were very clear. Um, it was uh, it was a war, uh, particularly an information war. And his job was to help countries and liberation movements that had no means of narrating themselves to do that. And the job is very, very clear. It's to create a narrative. That, so, you know, you'll understand m so much of the vocabulary is very familiar to us today. The French were speaking of the Algerian struggle for independence as events in Algeria. They didn't even call it a war. It's only a few years ago that French President Macron finally came out publicly and said, actually, it was a war. So they wouldn't name the thing. It was troubles and events. And then the people on the other side were terrorists, fundamentalists, and outlaws. They were not freedom fighters. And so Labudovic's job is to pre provide the counter-narrative. And what is truly interesting when you start going through his diaries and matching them up with his rushes is you can deconstruct what that takes. How do you create a narrative of a liberation movement? What does that mean in terms of the visual, visual language that you deploy? Well, the first thing that he does is he puts them all in the same uniform because they have to look like an army. You know, what separates the kind of outlaws from a liberation army is the discipline, the discipline of the movement, that there has to be, you know. And so all of these things are, for me, fascinating to unpack. And that's what I do in the second film, in the diptych, which is called Cine Guerrillas. And it's really looking into the construction of the filmic narrative of a liberation movement, but also in trying to understand what is a militant image and what role do militant images play in that particular era of decolonial struggle. You know, and, and so I, I find this, the more I read about third cinema and its an appearance in the late 60s and 70s, I began to think of Labudovic as the kind of precursor, the missing prequel to the story of third cinema, which is really a cinema that was about militancy. And one other thing that I really like liked when I dug into the, the kind of practices of third cinema is 
that the screening, so talking about distribution practices, the screening of the film was simply the the prelude to the conversation that came after. And the conversation that comes after is as important or perhaps even more than the screening of the film itself. And everything that I've done in the last two years since the films have come out, but also as I spoke to all of the things I tried to do prior to the films even existing, was very much in kind of trying to rend homage to that gesture of third cinema, which is, I'll show you some archive or I'll show you the finished film, let's talk after. And, and I've been doing as much as I can, baby daughter not you know, standing, to travel with the films and to really create these spaces of dialogue after the screening that would be in the philosophy with which these images were made in the first place. And what's come out of that experience? Oh, so much learning um, and awakening to... I have to say that, obviously, for me, the most important screenings have been in the Global South. Showing the films in Algeria has been extraordinary. I went to show them in Cairo in January, and those conversations were so meaningful because we're speaking of a political legacy that has been denied to the young generation in those countries as much as it's been denied to young generation in Yugoslavia that they're very hungry for, that has been transmitted to them, if at all, via family stories. So it's, it's become pri part of private memory. <clears throat> That's a really beautiful thing to observe. And obviously the conversation very quickly brings us to the necessity for new political imaginaries today. You know, where is a kind of progressive global left-wing vision today? All of these hallmarks of non-alignment, so it's a kind of transnational solidarity. In the film you call the non-aligned movement a promise that has not been delivered. Uh, so can you talk about the value in making a film about uh, a 60-year-old idea that didn't really come to fruition? <laughs> that 60-year-old idea that basically didn't even take off. Yes. Um, it's worth saying that the non-aligned movement still exists today. Uh but is so irrelevant and so far away from that original idea that it would have been, in, in terms of um, introducing the subject matter to people who have never heard of it, maybe a more expansive you know, film would have told the story of how they tried and failed. <clears throat> but as I say very early on in the film, my entire adult life has been marked by a succession of political failures, you know, the failure of Yugoslavia, then we had a revolution in 2000. I tell this story in my second film that failed. And I kind of needed for my own health, I think, to look at how projects, political visions are born, not how they betray us and fail. And I made a very conscious decision in making this film that I'm, I want to look at the moment where something so disparate, countries so different, ideologies, you know, religions, races that were so different could find a way to come together to formulate an idea. And I felt that that was so powerful and so necessary for the present moment that it was much more important to do than to give a kind of, you know, exhaustive account of a movement that tried and then failed. So it was a very deliberate choice to speak of the moment that things crystallize and come together as opposed to the moment when things inevitably, you know, fail our expectations and betray our hopes and, and kind of wither wither away. And so it's a film that's deliberate in its <laughs> choice of gaze, which is the moment of birth. Um, and I kind of find that people are really warm to that, you know, that, that we are in such desperate need of a new beginning that, you know, to say let's look at that is, is a very valuable thing to do today. You described how you grew up in an anti-Tito family. In these films, you're shining a light on uh, really positive things that uh, th uh, that Tito did. Um, and I wonder how you reflect on that. Um, it's funny. So I was in, as I mentioned, I was in Cairo in January. And the reason I was there was not just to hold the films, uh, to show the films, but to hold these workshops. And uh, that's become part of this larger artistic project that I mentioned, which we've called Nonline Newsreels, and it's been an, an, a gesture to extend the research that I've been doing beyond the making of these two films into finding ways to get this footage to the countries where it was filmed. And so what I've been doing for the last uh, four or five years now is these um, silent screening workshops 
that incidentally we developed at the CPH lab um, and were mentored in with, by Katerina Cizik, who is from the MIT collaboration. It was just a fantastic way to figure out a form um, that invites other people into the process. I go to a place like Algiers or Cairo. I bring with me the archives that I have so far scanned because we're still scanning archive. Um, and I do a public call for people to participate, and they come into cinema, I give them a kind of brief background, and then I launch the footage. And because it's silent, what we do is we pass around a microphone, and people do these live improvised narrations of what they see on screen. So sometimes they will overlay the footage with personal stories or family anecdotes. Sometimes it'll be an analysis. Sometimes it'll be pointing out things that, are, that they see on screen. And I record this, and I've been turning this into video installations. So it gives you, as a viewer, a, an opportunity to watch at the same time, it's a two-screen installation, the footage and the person commenting the footage. And it's been this idea of finding new political layers over the storytelling. And this is a long intro to your question. But when I was in Cairo, one of the things that I did during the silent screenings is I was showing them footage of Nasser. And I said, it was kind of the most naively way, so what do you think of Nasser? And, you know, the answer was like, how many days do you have for us to tell you? So, it's, you know, the answer is it's complicated. And all this to say that if the same way you were to ask me, what do you think of Tito? It would take me three days to answer. And the answer is ultimately it's complicated. Um, and funnily enough, I have now made a second film that has Tito in it with any without any real intention ever of addressing him so much as a historical figure. But... However disputed Tito is today, and he is heavily disputed, even within the former Yugoslavia, you know, there's a group of people that have been referred to as Yugo nostalgics who are kind of, you know, harking back to his time. There's people who see him as the kind of authoritarian dictator who had political prisoners. The truth is, as always, somewhere in between and both at the same time. But one thing that I have not seen people dispute Really, anywhere I've taken these films in the former Yugoslavia, I was in Ljubljana, the capital of Slovenia, two weeks ago to show the films. I've shown them in Macedonia and Skopje and Montenegro and Sarajevo. Uh, no one disputes the value of what Tito did for Yugoslavia in the foreign policy arena by being one of the leaders of the non-aligned movement, by putting Yugoslavia in this relationship and network with the third world project. That is undisputable. And I'll tell you why. Because wherever you travel today, Mexico, India, wherever I've been, if people ask me where I'm from, if I say Serbia, they've never heard of it or they think it's Siberia. But if I say Yugoslavia, doors open in a way that you could not understand. I've had taxi drivers in New Delhi refusing to take my cab fare. I've, it's just, it's extraordinary if you say you're from Yugoslavia. And just to think that, you know, 30 years after the disappearance of a country and 60 years after this summit, the simple fact of being Yugoslav can open doors for you, you know, in Tunisia, in Egypt, in Cuba, is extraordinary. And for me, this speaks to the seeds that were planted. It's almost as if, and I find this when I talk to people from Vietnam or Indonesia, that we've been given a kind of common political language that we speak and that we share, and I find the the kind of complicity of understanding that I have with people from other non-aligned countries is deep, even though, as I say, politically the project didn't work, and it's a total failure today, but somewhere on a human, personal level, it's left deep, deep, deep traces. I want to thank Mila Trelich for speaking with me. Most recent films, Non-Aligned and Cinegorillas, are distributed in the U.S. by Icarus Films. Her earlier works, The Other Side of Everything and Cinema Communisto, are available for rent on Amazon Prime. Thanks to the School of Visual Arts Social Documentary Program for giving me a space to record this interview. Thanks to our team, series producer Hannah Nordenswan, newsletter manager Bella Racklin, and web designer Cross Strategy. Our theme music is composed by Andre Williams, and our executive producer is Raphael Nehausen. I'm Tom Powers. Follow us on Instagram and sign up for our newsletter at purenonfiction.net. Thank you.